is Cynthia Edwards, as, as Hillary mentioned, and I coordinate the Southeast Conservation Adaptation Strategy uh, across the six LCCs of the Southeast. Uh, so I'm going to uh, give an overview this morning and partway through hand it over to Rua to talk more specifically about one of our first um, products, which is the, the Southeast Conservation Blueprint version 1.0. So today I'll talk quickly about why CKIS, why we needed it, and what was the driver behind it. Some of our progress to date and a few of the projects that have come out of it some emerging opportunities across the region, uh, some next steps, just so you can see what we're, what we're up to in the next uh, three to six months, and then provide some options to get engaged. Um, we really are encouraging folks across the Southeast, if they haven't been engaged in some of the LCC activities, to do so, and, and I'll, I'll provide some information on that. So why CKIS? So there's a lot of pressures on the the land that supports us in the southeast. We have a lot of urbanization and we see a lot of farmland and forest lands going under the um, under the concrete to provide housing. Uh, this map actually is one of the scariest ones I've seen uh, about the emerging mega regions. It's such a great place to live in the southeast, hence a lot of people want to live here. So we see a lot of um, urbanization that's that's really eating up our, our natural areas. We've got sea level rise on the Gulf Coast and the Atlantic Coast. This is the highway that comes out of the Isle de Jean Charles band in uh, southwest Louisiana. To, um, and they're, they're going to be our first climate refugees in North America. So that's um, pretty scary when you're talking about moving whole, uh, whole families and not allowing them to, to rebuild on their lands. We've got fire, uh, fire we want in the southeast to, to manage our um, grasslands and forest lands. So, uh, and that's becoming increasingly difficult in part due to the urbanization map I showed earlier. We've also got fires we don't want. This is from West Texas last, uh, um, last week when they had the wildfires. So those are also becoming issues, of course. And like I mentioned, we do have a great, um, Place, it, the Southeast is a great place to live. In fact, when we had our CECAS coordinators meeting last year, um, that emerged as a real theme for us. We have a great culture of hunting and fishing. We have access to some beautiful places, beaches and Appalachian streams, and, and it's a great place to live. So that puts a lot of pressure on our resources. There's large disruptive changes impacting conservation. So you put all those things together and it becomes pretty apparent that if we don't do something, fish and wildlife are going to get the leftovers of what's remaining on the land after all of these other pressures are, are pushing it. So what the, uh, back in 2011, the state directors of the 15 states in the Southeast identified the need to develop a vision for fish and wildlife so that we wouldn't just be satisfied with the leftovers after everything else was, was done. So we've, um, it was initiated in 2011, the strategy, and we've provided updates at the CAFWA, the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agency conferences every year since then. And in 2015, we had a summit at the meeting in Asheville uh, that really re-energized, I guess, the, the CECAS effort. And I'll talk in a few minutes about what we did uh, last fall. So the, I want to emphasize a couple things here. The conservation adaptation strategy was initiated by the 15 states in the Southeast. They, um, led by Ed Carter out of Tennessee, he then invited the um, federal agencies, the 12 federal agencies that make up the Southeast Natural Resource Leadership Group, or SNRLEG. Um, at that time, the LCCs that, that many of you are familiar with were just getting underway, and they were identified as sort of the opportunity to get the work done that we would need through this. So that's, uh, that's where the LCCs come in to provide sort of the horsepower to get this vision developed and, and then begin to do that implementation. It was understood right from the beginning that uh, 
They wanted coordination with the also at that time new climate science centers, specifically in our region, the uh, Southeast Climate Science Center that's based in Raleigh and the South Central Climate Science Center that's based in Norman, Oklahoma, as well as the Southeast Aquatic Resource Partnership. We wanted to make sure there was a strong linkage to the aquatic resources as well. And then given that the LCCs in the Southeast are all self-directed partnerships, that also provides an opportunity to broaden um, that work through a, a bigger network of partners and, and sectors. So we'll touch on that again in a few minutes. So this is our, our map just depicting where those six um, landscape conservation cooperatives are. You'll see some white space, Texas and Oklahoma, Missouri and, and Virginia. That doesn't mean that we're not coordinating with those folks. It just means that those um, areas that are covered by different landscape conservation cooperatives uh, weren't, haven't been as fully engaged. But as I'll show at the end of the presentation, we do have some emerging uh, opportunities to expand that reach. So the visions. People ask me um, if you had to boil down CECUS to, to one thing, I think it really is a, a vision. We want to see a connected network of landscapes and seascapes that support those fish and wildlife resources that we're all um, working to, to protect. The fish and wildlife resources and all of the benefits that the protection, restoration of those areas provides as well. And so this is really about coordinating those conservation actions and investments to, to focus on those common goals. So all of those pressures that we mentioned earlier, they also provide an an opportunity for the conservation community to, to focus those efforts on where the best opportunities are to, um, to protect those areas and to make sure that we don't have fish and wildlife resources that just get the leftovers after everyone else is done. I'm going to touch just quickly on some early accomplishments. As I recognize many of the names in the in the in the attendee list here, but uh, some of you may be familiar with the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment, which was completed in 2015. This was really the first um, broad effort where we worked with the four landscape co conservation cooperatives across the, the Gulf, so the Gulf Coast Prairie, Gulf Coast of Plains and Ozarks, uh, South Atlantic has this little piece, uh, a little piece in the Big Bend area of Florida, and then Peninsular Florida LCC. And we developed the Gulf Coast Vulnerability Assessment that really looked at uh, four habitats and 11 species and their relative vulnerability. So these are the four ecosystems we looked at, barrier islands, tidal emergent marsh, oyster reefs, and mangroves. And then we also looked at the vulnerability of a suite of species within each of those. So this was uh, uh, completed, as I mentioned, in 2015, and it utilized the capacity of about 58 or 59 experts across the Gulf who provided information to let us assess the vulnerability of these systems and species. Uh, I'd strongly encourage you to, to take a look at uh, project pages on the four LCCs in the Gulf. Um, this is available or you can contact one of us. Skipping ahead now, I want to talk a little bit about the CECUS Leadership Summit that we had last fall at the CIAFO meeting in Baton Rouge. It was our five-year anniversary of the effort and we really wanted to take the opportunity to celebrate sort of the success that we've had to date and, and provide some additional excitement about the effort. We will, unveiled the CECUS Blueprint version 1.0, which I'm going to turn this over to Rua in a few minutes to talk about. And we also wanted to sort of reaffirm uh, our continued engagement from the state agencies as well as the federal agencies in that, in that leadership role. And there's some good accomplishments. So we also highlighted six use cases that, uh, that really put sort of some meat on the bones, so to speak, of uh, tangible products that were already in use. I'm going to show just a couple pictures. Um, we were standing room only. We had two different sessions, one that focused on the state and federal leadership. And then um, that's Ed Carter giving his overview. And then we also had a broader one that focused on a, a much broader audiences. So we 
um, two hours of this four-hour session focused on why CKIS and, and the last couple hours focused on how we were going to get it done. So that's uh, Rua talking about the blueprint, which I'm going to turn it over to him in just a second. I wanted to show you one quote. Um, one of the things we try to do is to get uh, stories or uh, make sure that we're providing useful information and tools that people are actually using. So this quote's from Susan Gibson in the, the Department of Defense. Uh, Susan is a representative on that Southeast Natural Resource Leadership Group. And this is a quote that she gave us at following the summit, kind of highlighting the tremendous partnership and the amount of interest in the effort, um, talking about the blueprint and how that can help them uh, work across the southeast and identify areas where they can maybe manage differently or or expand their reach and a platform for trust between partners and this was really emphasized at the summit as well that we we need to have that trust among partnerships especially as we as we broaden our reach into industry and private landowners that's going to be increasingly important so now I'm going to turn it over to Rua. He's going to talk to you a little bit more specifically about the blueprint. All right. Hello, everybody. I'm going to go take my screen here. Second. So now I'm going to talk in a little bit more detail about the blueprint itself and how it came together. So the CCAS blueprint basically this living map showing shared priorities for conservation and restoration. And what it's doing is it's pulling in the equivalent blueprints from LCCs covering the south. Uh, so that's the, the main cooperatives that you saw already on the map and also pulling in information to try to fill in some of those gaps up in, up in Virginia and up in Missouri and some of those other components. And so what uh, got released last fall was a sort of a version 1.0. So not surprisingly, there's plenty of room for improvement, uh, but this was the, the initial version of how we might be able to piece together these individual blueprints and, and come up with something seamless. So if you just spent zero time in styling and coloring and just downloaded the individual layers uh, from each of these uh, different blueprints used in 1.0, that looks like a pretty big mess, right? Um, so it, it takes a little bit of additional effort to think about how you put the pieces together, how you might style it, and, and how to integrate these different layers. So that's what we were doing over the last year. Um, way we decided how to integrate this stuff, uh, the, the first part was uh, the staff of each of the cooperatives just developing some integration options, just based on discussions with folks, lessons learned from previous efforts. Uh, where before we had CCAS when we tried to integrate, you know, South Atlantic and Peninsula Florida for particular purposes or, or some of these other examples. Um, took some of those lessons learned, came up with a few different options for how we might logically put it together for a first cut. And there were two big remaining questions uh, that came out of this. Uh, first off, the sort of how much to include, and, and each of the cooperatives have different priority levels and, and sort of percentages covered by the landscape, so how much how much priority gets in this CCAS blueprint, and then what to do about overlap zones. We've got a number of zones where um, the plans from each cooperative actually overlap with each other, which is great for thinking about how to stitch things together and playing off the strengths of each. Uh, but then it's a challenge, because then you have this question, well, what do you do in the overlap zones? And so these were great uh, questions to then bring to the Southeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies and the Southeast Natural Resource Leadership Group points of contact uh, to get that, that, those points of contact on the phone, uh, run them through a few different options and the trade-offs, and have them make a consensus decision on what we should do for version one. And so here's the integration approach. This is what they decided on. Uh, the, the first part. Uh, was to crosswalk each LCC blueprint to get areas of high and medium ecological value. So we, some of these have more detailed classes, but we could at least get sort of a high and medium class from, from everything. And the high priority was about 30% of the cooperative, and the medium was an additional 20%. So 30% comes from the literature and, and some uh, discussions about how much is doable in a rapidly changing landscape, and then your adding in the medium priority, and that's where a lot of the restoration opportunities and other pieces come about uh, that fits in a little bit more with the sort of broader half-earth kind of approach. 
so that was the, the, the first thing. Let's just crosswalk them all and get them in in similar. Now, I say about 30%. It's, it's close, but it's not exact. But roughly, that's, that's what you're shooting for. And then the decision from the group for areas of overlap was to include it if either plan identified it. So if it was in one, one, of the, one blueprint or another in an overlap zone, um, it made it in. And so that was sort of the most conservative uh, approach in that way. Um, you know, folks felt most comfortable with that, that approach for the area of overlap. So um, when you get these overlap zones, it's in there if either plan identifies it. Luckily, there was a lot of overlap when you, when you put these plans together where they lined up pretty well in, in most places, which was good to see, actually, better than I thought they were going to line up, which is good news. And the plan is to revisit this approach during the next revision. So we're in the next revision now, um, and, and so there'll be another updated version coming uh, in the fall CIAFO meeting. So this is going to be, this is the approach now. We'll take a look at that, see if that's the approach um, into the future. So here is version one. Actually, there's a prettier, even more cleaned up version of this, but this will give you the roughly I rough idea of the, the version one. Um, so the, the darkest blue is your kind of high conservation value. The lighter blue is the medium, the priority perspective. Um, so when you step back, a couple things to note. Um, actually, one particular thing that comes up a lot is the marine environment. Uh, you'll notice the South Atlantic is the only cooperative that really does the prioritization. It has a blueprint that goes out into the marine environment. Um, and so the other cooperatives have not quite um, gone there yet. I think Peninsula Florida is, is on is on track to do that in the next year or two. Um, we'll see how that goes. And so this map may include a little bit more of the marine environment as, as we move along. Um, and you'll also see that we filled in some of these other pieces with some other um, priorities from the LCCs that are not part of those core six. All right, so that's a lot, right? You take a look at that and you go, wow, that's, that's a whole lot of priority. How do, we, how do we narrow that down for specific cases? Uh, so here's an example. Uh, a specific real world example that came up a few years ago when we were working with North Carolina um, NRCS and they wanted to use the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint for prioritizing, looking and using that in their state rankings for things like EQUIP and, and, and a few of their programs. And the challenge we ran into is that if they're going to be part of the state rankings, we actually needed something that covered the entire state. Uh, so we didn't quite have that at that point. Um, but now we can actually start looking at um, more full state and full regional level pieces. So if we were going to talk about, you know, state level stuff related to um, economic incentives, here's the full blueprint. Let's maybe say pull out the existing protected areas when we're looking at potential economic incentives. And then now let's reduce that even further to look at incentives on cropland. And so now you have a much more, much smaller, much more manageable piece. Uh, just with a few simple filters based on the decision and question you're looking at. So that's a, a simple example of, of narrowing it down based on specific decisions. Not surprisingly, number of caveats so far, uh, particularly as we're connecting across these different blueprints at different levels of development. Uh, the first one, uh, those areas in blue don't represent exactly the same thing in each blueprint. So they're all areas of high conservation value, but there are some tweaked methods. and um, But there are also some data sets that are consistently used, um, things, some, of the, some things that go across a number of boundaries, DNC terrestrial resilience, approaches to riparian buffers, those kind of things. Um, specific outcomes aren't defined for all the individual blue areas. So, we don't exactly have models across the whole geography of what would happen if you did something so you know if we did protection if we did specific management if we did restoration in this place you know how is that connected with the outcomes the indicators themselves we do have models for some um, for some ecosystems in some places so we can do that in parts of the blueprint uh, but we can't do it for all of the blueprint yet another thing the blueprint's constantly evolving so we've committed now to update this annually as the new plans come together. So for those of you looking at the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint or even Appalachian or some of these new pieces coming, um, the, the new version of South Atlantic Blueprint 2.2, when it's final, will get wrapped into the next version of the, the blueprint. And same thing for all the other um, blueprints for each cooperative. Uh, future threats are only included in some portions of the blueprint. Um, so some of them, some of them haven't quite figured out the way they're going to do. Generally, a pattern for a lot of these things is uh, the 
the more eastern part of the CCAS blueprint is a little further along than the more western parts, um, just as a sort of a general rule. Um, so there, there are some components that aren't, aren't fully incorporated. Um, in general, the blueprint's providing value as a more regional-wide perspective when we need to cut across big areas and, and multiple states. Uh, might need to zoom in specific areas, especially maybe even going to the specifics of each individual blueprint um, for depending on what scale you're, you're looking at. Uh, and the last one is there's been a whole bunch of work um, so far, a lot of, whole lot of different folks involved for each of these processes. Um, and we've been taking a bottom-up approach which is kind of messy. Um, you know, you can account for the unique ecosystems and unique um, things going on in each cooperative, um, but you know, it is it is a little bit messier than than doing a one consistent approach across the whole piece. So it's a little more a little more doable because of the process, but there's plenty of room for improvement. So those are some big caveats to this this version. Next steps on the blueprint. Uh, so. There's more information, including GIS data and metadata, now available. So up on the CCAS DALP site under Blueprint, um, under the picture of the map, there's a link that you can kind of download the data and, and investigate and use it however you want. Um, the highest priority for the next update uh, is going to be things like identifying priorities for action in the next year, 10 years in the face of future change, and improving consistency in methods and approaches. So you know, across metrics, across approaches, across the region, working on improving the consistency across each of these blueprints. And uh, the update we have planned to be released for the fall uh, 2017 BIAFWA meeting. So the, whatever updates are happening pre that time, uh, we'll be folding that into the next iteration of the CCAS blueprint. And that is all I have on the blueprint. I can hand it back to you, Cynthia. Sure, thank you. Or maybe someone else. There you go. <laughs> Got it. Sorry. I don't have power. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thanks, Rua, for that. Um, I want to move back quickly to, um, as I mentioned at the summit last fall in Baton Rouge, we went through uh, much of what Rua just covered on the on the blueprint. We also uh, one of the things that the state directors wanted to see were some some use cases. So we provided uh, six sort of use cases of where the blueprint at various scales were being used to affect on the ground conservation. Um, because of time today, I, I'm going to touch on the one that we that we covered last fall and then highlight a couple other emerging ones also. So one of the one of the things that uh, the South Atlantic blueprint was used for last last year was to um, bring in new resources to, through resilient landscapes and fires. So at the summit last fall, Mike Edker of the Fish and Wildlife Service um, explained how the blueprint was used to attract new money to expand um, prescribed burning on state, federal, and private lands in the, in the southeast. And um, the blueprint was used to basically to demonstrate how wide range planning um, is important and can attract resources. Now much of the funding to date for, for this prescribed burn um, was a, is actually spent in the western states and so to have some of that money um, be attracted to the southeast to help us with burning was, was a real um, conservation success in that area. I was recently in Oklahoma and presented at the Natural Resource Conference there and I wanted to highlight some of the work that they're doing. Given where we're at with many of the state wildlife action plans in the southeast, uh, there's some real opportunity to make sure that those um, state conservation strategies, that the values that they want to see for fish and wildlife in the state level are reflected in the blueprint, and how can we then also go beyond those state lines to address species that obviously don't abide by geopolitical boundaries. So there's some emerging opportunities in the state wildlife action plans and uh, working with the Wildlife Diversity Committee um, of CAFWA. This was also presented at the, the, Oklahoma, the recent Oklahoma meeting, looking at uh, some of the ecological systems and the important base layers of data that are um, used to identify 
identify those priority areas in the in the blueprint that Rua mentioned. So this is being led by by Dave Diamond and um, Lee Elliott, uh, Alan Janis, uh, Dwayne German, and Amy Turkeen out of Texas, and then um, Bruce Hoagland also out of Oklahoma. So this is looking at um, making sure there's consistent data across those state lines on landscape uh, coverage. So that's emerging as well. So moving into what's next, uh, we want to continue to improve the blueprint. As Rue mentioned, there's um, some important issues that we want to uh, address here in the next year and then over the next number of years. The science coordinators are going to be meeting soon to, to work on that. One of the funded projects under the Southeast Climate Science Center is called Vital Futures. That's being led by uh, Bruce Stein for the National Wildlife Federation and uh, Kirsten Dow out of South Carolina. And they're looking at uh, how climate change has been addressed in the state wildlife action plans and also some emerging um, scenarios for climate change that we can use then to fill in some of what Rua mentioned that future conditions. Um, so this is a project that's looking at the CCAS wide um, area and, and some of those future conditions. Next week, we've got what, what we call our CCAS lead coordination team meeting, which in this particular meeting includes the science coordinators and coordinators of those six LCCs, plus um, new coordinator Kelly Myers out of the T Eastern Tallgrass Prairies Big River LCC. We've got um, additional folks from AFWA attending, as well as from the Northeast area. And we, um, we're we getting together in Raleigh next week to really talk about what our work plan is for the next year, including the science coordinators um, really trying to get their heads around how to address some of those issues that Rua mentioned. Because we're a state, uh, state director driven entity, so to speak. We will be attending this um, spring directors meeting in April to update them on a couple of the motions that came out of the meeting last fall. And I'll get to those in a minute. And then of course, and as Rue mentioned, we made a commitment to update the blueprint every year. And that will again this year be done at the CAFWA conference uh, in late October in Louisville, Kentucky. So just following up quickly, and I, I won't read these, but uh, following the summit last, last year, the state directors made two motions in their business meeting. One was to continue um, to work with the LCCs and ensure that state priorities continue to be reflected in that blueprint. And again, that's things like the state wildlife action plan or priority, priority species and issues. And so we're work, continuing to work on that. And then the other thing we wanted to do was uh, evaluate the effectiveness of our sort of how the CECAS family is, is structured and bring forward some recommendations for improvement. So we'll be doing that at the at the April meeting as well. Following up on on that leadership, the federal side on the federal side, they made a similar motion in at their meeting in January to uh, continue to ensure that uh, the federal agency's interests are reflected in future iterations of the blueprint and make sure that um, there's that support from the federal agencies to continue to be engaged in this effort at the LCC level and then and seek us wide as well. So a couple um, opportunities to get engaged. Uh, several of the LCCs are doing uh, blueprint workshops. The South Atlantic is just getting underway with their newest round of blueprint workshops next week. The Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks uh, Science Coordinator Todd Jones Friend is meeting with um, various partners across his geography here in this spring. The Gulf Coast Prairie is just getting underway with uh, a landscape design project there. And then, of course, Peninsula Florida is uh, hosting workshops and the Appalachian has had some uh, recent workshops as well. So those are all opportunities to get engaged. Um, I encourage you to check out the website. I'll show the CECAS website address in a minute, but also the individual LCCs. They send out great newsletters, um, have a lot of information about upcoming opportunities and webinars. And when um, um, data or information is updated on the Conservation Planning Atlas as well. 
Same for the Southeast Aquatic Resources Partnership. They have a great uh, newsletter as well and are also in the midst of uh, busily talking about the Southeast Aquatic Resource Partnership at things like the at various fishery societies. And then also the Climate Science Center, if you have an opportunity to get engaged with some of those projects as well. So I just want to quickly touch on connecting up with uh, other regional efforts. You'll see in the, the blueprint version 1.0 that Rua showed that there is um, coverage in the Northeast and the, the, the state of Missouri. And so one of the things we want to make sure we continue to do is, is work closely with the North e Northeast Regional Conservation Framework, um, some of their landscape design efforts. There is an emerging uh, opportunity in the Midwest with both the Mississippi River Gulf Hypoxia Initiative that's being uh, spearheaded by the Eastern Tallgrass Prairies Big Rivers, LCC, um, Gwen White and, and Kelly Myers, and then potentially expanding that into an even bigger emerging Midwestern effort. So we've also, uh, one of our coordinators, Mallory Martin, spoke at the Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies meeting last fall as well. There's also been um, Cindy Doner, who is our uh, liaison to the federal agencies at a Fish and Wildlife Service in Atlanta, has presented to the Western Governors Association, and, and we've um, had some good interest from the West to kind of expand this concept uh, beyond, uh, beyond Texas and Oklahoma as well. So there's lots of information out there. As Rua mentioned uh, the seekasoutheast.org website uh, has got uh, a lot of information on the blueprint as well as some of the use cases in a great story map that we that we put together. Uh, the actual data layers are available on the Southeast Region uh, Conservation Planning Atlas. If you want to get regular updates, you can let me know. I kind of update uh, a emerging list of individuals on kind of our what we're up to every month and then that's my contact information if uh, after today you have additional questions or you want additional information don't hesitate to to contact me I'm more than happy to to chat with you about CECAS and Hillary that was that was all I had this is our um, landscape conservation cooperative crew so to speak uh, after the summit last fall in in Baton Rouge so I'll turn it back to you Hillary all right thanks Cynthia um thanks to you too Rua it was a great presentation um I'd say we have probably 10 or 15 minutes for for questions so plenty of time for a good Q&A here um Greg did any questions pop up in the question box that you want to go ahead and run with well, nobody has um, sent me any written questions yet, but I would just encourage people now, if you have questions, you could either put it in the question box or you could raise your hand. There's a little raise hand function that is should you should see available to you, and we will try and unmute you so that you can ask your question directly. So we have the usual bashful silence. I'm sure somebody must have a question. Don't be shy. Someone's got to break the ice here. Okay, Chuck Rowe. I'm going to try and unmute. Are you there, Chuck? I was experimenting, so I'm on the spot. Uh, <laughs> well, a question about how far you have gone in defining uh, conservation, uh, the implementation. Uh, Last week or so at the uh, annual Biodiversity Days uh, conference in Durham, uh, E.O. Wilson was asked at the end of his address uh, if he had a personal definition of uh, what qualified as protected land, and he did not. He, he, defer, he punted to the next generation of, of us conservationists uh, to, to determine our definition of success. Uh, so is that uh, a, a, that basic question something uh, CECAS is, is considering? Yeah, this is Cynthia. I'll, I'll maybe take a crack at, at that and then Rua can correct me. Um, 
So conservation in terms of uh, both restoration, management, and protection is addressed a little bit differently in each of the six landscape conservation cooperatives. Some of those high priority areas are focused on existing areas that are in e either good or good shape or have the potential to be um, restored or managed differently. And in others, there's a focus on both more equally, I guess, the, the conservation and for the protection of existing areas and the additional restoration potential. So I think um, it varies a little bit among LCCs and that gets to one of the things that Rua brought up that we need to focus on in the next year and, and beyond is uh, the methods that are used to identify those areas need to be, uh, we want to work on the consistency of those. Because each of the LCCs are self-directed partnerships, there is, has been a little bit of difference in those priorities. I would say to build on to that, that the, the big question that you're kind of asking, Chuck, is that I think is exactly the whole idea of having one of these big shared strategies is, you know, defining what does success look like? What is, you know, what are we shooting for collectively? How do we make sure we're on track? How do we get there? You know, setting some doable, and I mentioned that before, the sort of priorities for action in the next 10 years. Where do we need to be? What are we shooting for? How do we make sure we're on track? So. There are some some differences in you know small I would say mostly pretty small differences in in flavors and technical details of how you pick out what are restoration zones versus you know incentives versus et cetera across the um, the plan just as Cynthia said so there are some you know some technical details but I from what I've seen in all of them and from what I understand all the cooperatives you know the the bigger intent you know the bigger thinking about um, conservation is that full portfolio of, of actions, particularly including, you know, incentives and, and other components. Um, I think they're, they're, they're thought about fairly similar, and, and a lot of the differences are more in the technical ability for defining them. Um, but in general, I think this, you know, this is, this is a great vehicle to think of the South, you know, the, the level of the South and, and say, you know, what, what does success look like, and are we getting there, and what do we need to do to get there? In the South Atlantic, Chuck, we often refer back to the open standards for conservation, conservation action taxonomy, um, which includes not just conservation easements and fee title protection, but management, but restoration, livelihood and economic incentives, even policy that might help direct smart growth practices in an urban area. So we think of all of those actions as being on the table. Good, thank you. I'll, I'll continue the conversation with some of you next Tuesday at your Blueprint workshop. Great, we'll see you then. Thanks, Chuck. Any other questions? Yeah, I think we have one here from Rick Derbro. We also have one from Susan Rupp, but it's about contact information that we can follow up at the end of the webinar or afterwards. But Rick, I'm going to unmute you. Would you like to ask your question? Are you there? Yeah, I'm trying to make sure I press unmute. I don't have my glasses on. Uh, I've got actually a couple of people here, and I'm going to let um, let them ask their own questions. Okay. Christine McKay, Water Protection Division here at EPA Region 4. I was just curious if you have a communication outreach strategy for local governments. So this is Cynthia. I'll take a crack at that. Um, we actually are working on a, an outreach strategy and that's going to be one of the focuses of that lead coordination team meeting that I mentioned that's going on next week. There's been some additional capacity added to our team in the last little while and, and we want to really move on that engagement strategy and, and local governments is certainly a topic that was discussed at the summit last fall. Um, so not yet. But that is, that is emerging as it's going to continue to be an area of focus, especially in the next sort of 12 to, to 18 months. And I might also add, um, in the South Atlantic, um, sometimes individual LCCs are taking steps to engage with local government more below that CCAS umbrella. We've been working in the South Atlantic on a project with the American Planning Association to improve um, the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint in and around urban areas and part of that was a urban conservation summit that we held in Atlanta last fall that 
turned out about 20 different local county planners and water resource professionals um, to help get that conversation started. So we definitely have a lot of room to grow in that area and it's a focus for improving our blueprint and improving the diversity of our cooperative community going forward, but we're starting to, to kind of bite off that piece. Uh, and this is Rick, and I just wanted to mention that uh, the uh, EPA has put together an uh, internal communications uh, outreach effort that's going to actually work through the other Southeast Natural Resource Leaders Group agencies to be able to uh, coordinate our activities and get input to support CECAS over the next 8 to 18 months. Great. So is, is that it for the Rick Durbro end? You know I always have more questions. <laughs> <laughs> we did have one other I'll person. Hold all, I'll hold all mine until next week. Okay. <laughs> We're allowed to use Rick because he's on our steering committee. So. <laughs> Thank you. So we have a question from Tim Jones, and he just has his hand raised, so I'm going to unmute Tim Jones. Are you there? Uh, if you can hear me, I am. Yes. Um, so. Rua, is there any um, intent of ever letting us drill down to understand how these priorities will affect the individual indicators that uh, you put into the blueprint? I love that you asked that question, Tim, because we're, we're actually working on that at, at two different levels. So, you know, each cooperative is working on those, those pieces. So we have some different layers for, for drilling in. And actually, if you want to follow up, we can talk more on, on how to do it with the South Atlantic data. Um, but the other component that is actually going to be part of the discussion at um, this upcoming CCAS meeting next week is amongst the sort of science coordinators breakout is we're going to be talking about how to do this for the full CCAS blueprint as well. So how do you pull when you've got sort of multiple cooperatives with some different methods and different pieces, how do you peel back and go at a, a pixel or a catchment or subwatershed, click on that and then see okay, what, you know, why are these areas a priority? What's going into it? In some cases, it might be for multiple cooperatives and things like that. So that's one of the things we're going to be working with from a, an access perspective of, of how you drill down into some of the whys of, of um, those, different, those different pixels. So that is a very high priority <laughs> to, to work on. Of course, that's the first, you know, it's like, oh, okay, that's great. I see that this data went in here. I see that this happened, but okay, now that I look at this individual place, why is this a high priority given all the different things? Or if I care about, you know, the, you know, the ones that are best for birds or the ones that are best for these different resources, you want to be able to pull those out. So, right. um, yes, that's super important. <laughs> okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. The easiest way to do that now in the South Atlantic is probably to download all of the data layers and just kind of play with um, looking at which indicators score highly in an area that you're particularly interested in. But as Rua said, um, getting that into our interfaces in a really user-friendly way has been a little trickier, and it's a very high priority for us to, to crack that nut in the next couple, uh, couple years. OK, well, right now, the last question that we have outstanding is from Susan Rupp. So I'm going to unmute Susan. Are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I just actually typed into the chat box that that last question was addressing exactly uh, part of the reason I wanted to figure out if there were any ways of getting in touch with the individual state collaborators that have been part of the, the CECAS blueprint. Um, so that last question kind of addressed my question. It, yeah, and I think um, the best way to do that, maybe Susan, is to is to work through the the LCCs that that you're most interested in. Um, so if the, it's the Gulf Coast Prairie or, or the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks, um, both of which are in areas that I know you work in, so it would might be best to work through those those folks. Okay, great. I can follow up with you then. Thank you. Yeah, you can. Yeah, contact me, Susan. Anything else? We still have a little time, so if you have other questions, feel free. Let's see, I, um, Rick Bro, did you raise your hand again, or? I guess not. He didn't. Um, right now, that's, well, no, here's one. Mary Long has a question. 
Mary, you're unmuted. Yeah, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm, I'm curious if this is filtering down beyond the state level. There is a number of very large regional planning efforts going on across the southeast that really is being initiated more by municipalities. Is there any discussion between CECAS and these particular um, planning efforts that you're aware of? Could you give a or little more detail about planning efforts? Well, for example, the Knoxville Regional Metropolitan Area is doing a planning effort through 2040. And I'm curious if, if efforts like that, that encompass large areas of, of different states, are at all engaged with the LCCs or with um, something like CECAS. So is this actually filtering? I'm sorry? Oh, I was saying I think Knoxville would probably, would, are they in the Appalachian? I was wondering if anyone in the App LCC was on to maybe take that. But. Yeah, I don't think there's anyone from the App LCC on, but um, I guess my, and I'm not familiar with that one in particular, but there are certainly regional planning efforts depending on the LCCs and, and the engagement, those are being included in and identified. That's one of the reasons we want to continue to do sort of outreach and to additional groups is to make sure we can get as much of that included as, as we can. So how, how would that, would that work by the state getting involved with the, the regional planning efforts, the metropolitan regional planning efforts? Again, it's that thing of having this broad course um, yeah. strategy and, and really bringing it down to to the effort at the more local level. Yeah, and I think that following up on, on the earlier question about the engagement of, of local governments, that's certainly been identified as one of the mm, target groups, I guess, that we, we need to reach out to more. I know in addition to the examples that Hillary mentioned earlier, there's some work going on in the Chenier Plain of Texas and Louisiana, for example, with those sort of local authorities and local governments as well. So I say I would say that that's, that's coming. And again, I think the best opportunity is to work through the specific LCC and their coordinators and science coordinators or, or additional staff like, like Hillary. So. Yeah, this is and on, oh. Go ahead, Cynthia. I just wanted to also mention that on the CECAS website, the CECASSoutheast.org, uh, all our contact information is there as well as lists of existing state and federal partners and representatives too. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, I would add one quick thing on that. Hi, Mary. Um, this is Rua. So, um, yeah, the what in our experience so far in the South Atlantic has been um, you know, a, when we've worked on a few specific, I mean, around here in some of the, the triangle area of counties and municipalities and um, kind of looking to make some progress around Tallahassee and, and Atlanta and some other regional planning efforts, you know, it's kind of been a, it's been a combination where, you know, you have, as long as you've got connections with some of the key folks that the local planners are already going to be working with, um, and the data works well enough in that municipality area, um, then we have some opportunities. But there's, I think there's still a long way to go of, of bringing down, you know, in some cases the course level stuff can be helpful, but I think it's probably going to take a, a few years of growing together and learning to make this bigger blueprint um, detailed enough to be um, as useful in those, those local pieces. Um, but we're starting to get a few case studies where we're making, making some progress. And you'll find, in fact, this, the, 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 that specific example of state folks, uh, North Carolina has their green growth toolbox where they have staff and work with municipalities for um, helping them do smart growth and green planning. And they do actually use the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint, which is part of the CCAS Blueprint, um, as one of the planning resources that they provide and, and mention in their, in their documents. Uh, so it is getting into the arsenal of, of some some folks that are working more closely with the 
some of the municipalities. Um, but it is, I think it's, it's definitely a work in progress. There are some connections and some opportunities, but I think it's going to take a little bit of growing together and improvements before it becomes a major player in some of these plans. And in particular, I think these multi-county plans um, are, are where it shines the most. Thanks, Drew. So we've got about five minutes till um, we're at the hour, so I think I'm going to proceed just with a quick preview of next month's web forum and some updates from LCC staff. Um, next month we're going to be hearing from Dr. Tom Allen, who's with Old Dominion University, he was formerly with East Carolina University. Um, this is maybe a little bit more of a traditional South Atlantic web forum setup, but if you're interested in marshes, um, I would definitely encourage you to tune in, definitely even if you're outside of the South Atlantic geography. He's going to be talking about the results of a project that was funded by the South Atlantic LCC to develop high and low marsh maps for the entire geography. Um, so he's going to give a recap of the thematic classification scheme that was developed to map high versus low marsh. He's going to cover the object-based image analysis methods, uh, the results um, of the accuracy assessment, and the final format of raster versus vector marsh map products. So he's going to highlight how um, the Landsat 8 OLI can be useful for monitoring salt marshes and introduce a suite of normalized difference multispectral indices to accompany the maps. Um, so that's what we have to look forward to next month. Hope that you'll join us on the 20th of April. And some updates from LCC staff. Uh, registration is still open for the South Atlantic LCC's Blueprint Workshops, which you heard Chuck Rowe mention that he's going to be coming to um, the one next week in Chapel Hill. Registration, we've gone ahead and closed for Chapel Hill just because it's a few days out, but um, if you do still think you might be interested in coming to Chapel Hill, I'd just ask that you email me directly and we could try to accommodate you. Um, I hope that many of you can join us for, for a workshop. The dates and locations are here and you can learn more about it um, on this Blueprint Workshop webpage on the South Atlantic's website. And then we do have Draft Blueprint 2.2 um, ready for review on the Conservation Planning Atlas here in the South Atlantic. You can find all of the layers that were used to produce the blueprint on the Blueprint 2.2 data gallery on the Conservation Planning Atlas. So that's indicators, corridors, the ecosystem prioritizations, and the blueprint itself. And of course, this is one of the things that you'll be doing at the workshops if you do come um, to the, in the morning. You'll be reviewing Draft Blueprint 2.2. But if you can't come to a workshop, um, you can also share your input on a little online comment form that you can find on Rua's blog about the draft blueprint, and that's um, on the homepage of the South Atlantic website. And then we also have a webinar coming up in the Gulf Coastal Plains and Ozarks LCC. Greg? Yes, uh, we have a tentative date, which is May 4th at 1 p.m., but I haven't quite pinned that down yet. But this is to present the second half of a quite extensive ecosystem services project that covered four different sub-geographies in the GCPO, and we already had one section presented, uh, and this second webinar will be looking at uh, survey results of landowners and how they view their land, why they own land, what their concerns are, and willingness to pay for a certain select subset of uh, services, as well as an intriguing network analysis looking at how conservation providers and program staff relate or do not relate to each other within the region. So uh, please check our website for details on that. Thanks, Greg. Um, so last slide, I always like to wrap up with how to get more involved in your cooperative. Um, I'd encourage you to join the South Atlantic LCC web community by signing up on the website. That'll get you added to our monthly newsletter and a monthly reminder about this web forum. You can always con connect with your staff or with other members of your cooperative. And then, of course, we'd encourage you to explore the Conservation Blueprint online. And uh, Cynthia gave a lot of great other next steps for getting more involved and, and learning more about CCAS as well. Um, we will post the recording of this webinar and the slides on the South Atlantic LCC website on the calendar event. And I, I think it'll probably go out with a follow-up email from, from Greg for anyone uh, who was registered for this web forum as well. Um, so unless there are any other questions or comments, I think we'll wrap up. It's 11 o'clock here in Raleigh. Um, thank you so much for joining us.